started, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. I know we have, uh, we're currently in a, a bit of a community crisis, so that's why we're all keeping our masks on indoors. Um, but we've amplified ourselves, <laughs> so it'll make it a lot easier to hear us. Um, I'm Melissa Diaz. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the cultural arts curator here at the Nearing Estate. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be able to present contemporary arts programming and an artist in residence program here at the estate. Um, all of our contemporary art programming is inspired by the legacy of Charles Deering. The space that we're sitting in here is the, the Great Hall, and when Mr. Deering lived in this property at the beginning of the 20th century, it was at once filled with his art collection. So this room was filled with Rembrandts and Gauguin's and John Singer Sargent's and John Classes and great, great masterworks that he had amassed during his, his lifetime. So in honor of that, we use this space as a temporary exhibition space. And we have about four different art exhibits throughout the year. For more information on any upcoming shows, I encourage you to visit our website for information as well as our social media channels. Um, today's exhibition and today's program is a combination of all, both our exhibition program and our artist in residence program. Amalia Caputo um, is, has been an artist in residence at the Daring Estate since 20, you came in 2019, the end, right? Well, I agree, technically I started in January 2020. That's right. Yeah. So she has been an artist in residence during the pandemic, during a very, very intense time, but the result of that residency and her hard work and her research here has resulted in this exhibition. Um, so I'm very, very much looking forward to sharing you, um, to sharing her work with you today, and to have you hear a little bit more in depth about Amalia and her project at Deering Estate. So without further ado, I want to acknowledge a few people that are here with me and around. Um, Summer Levitt in the back is our curatorial associate, who has been a great help with today's program and this exhibition. Sophia Guerra is um, our assistant curator for this project, and she's an independent curator and writer based in Miami, currently an associate at LNS Gallery in Oak Grove, um, curatorial intern here at the Deering Estate, and in the spring of 2020, she graduated from FIU Honors with a BA in Art History, with a focus on the Enlightenment period and a minor in World Religions. So thank you, Sophia, for joining us today. And now, it's my great honor to introduce Amalia from a quick bio for Amalia for those of you that might not know her. She's a Venezuelan American Miami based artist working at the intersection of photography, video, and installation. Caputo's practice is connected to the feminine nature of the archive and memory. Her work deals with the construction of memory through photographic image and photo archives in the age of digital and social media. Caputo is interested in reflecting upon the ephemeral versus the permanent power of images. She received her BA in art history from the Universidad Central de Venezuela and an MFA in studio art and photography from New York University and the International Center of Photography. Caputo's work has been shown in several museums and galleries nationally and internationally, including the Museum of Latin American Art in Los Angeles, Hollywood Art and Culture Center in Aventura, Florida, the Girls Club, Collect Girls Club Collection in Fort Lauderdale, Coral Gables Museum of Art, the Arte de la Colón in Paris, in Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Zulia in Venezuela, and the Cinemanteca Distrital de Bogota, among many, many others. In 2020, she received an Ellie's Award from Blue Light Arts for this project. And please join me in welcoming Amalia Caputo. <laughs> Can you share a little bit about that process? 
Yeah, well, um, I have been working uh, creating large scale visual uh, photography atlases for like almost a decade or more. And uh, in that process, I'm interested in the construction of archives. So when I started my residency here, I thought that I would build something in relation to the actual Deering archives. Um, and it had a relationship with nature in the sense that I was going to go through the work of the photographer John Cookle Small, who did naturalist explorations here, and um, Charles Story Smith. Um, but as I progressed in my residency, I became, I became more and more attached to the natural aspect of the region. So um, I tried to, at the beginning, in, 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 with this idea of kind of mapping my own territory within the Deering, I started to photograph and document my daily walks. And um, so this became kind of a, ha of a habit. And um, so in all these walks, I would photograph and find things. And then <clears throat> this idea of the, the cultural aspect of Deering and the natural, I, I focused more on the natural part progressively. And uh, so my idea at the beginning was always to work with the archive, uh, but it so developed to be a, an archive of the ephemeral. I have been working with this notion of the atlas for a long time, and I think it's always a work in progress. It's not a definite one, but it's something that you build up uh, subjectively throughout time. So um, the residency gave me the opportunity to uh, have a long like, time here, and that was very, I think it was very good for the project because it developed itself in a way. And I kind of um, got more involved after also about thinking about what nature is as a construct, as a cultural construct, and how is the observation of nature something that, um, because like the observation of landscape is just the contemplation of what we are not. It's just what we position outside of of ourselves. So in that sense, I think that um, to be here for an extended period of time made me um, go throughout all these kind of questions and readings. And so the opportunity was to have like a research time and a field trip time and pr production time for, for like all this, uh, amassing this enormous uh, archive that I've done throughout the year. And it all coincided with a uh, with strange time in nature. <laughs> uh, we were here and everybody was like with their eyes very wide open, not knowing what was going to happen. And the idea of nature um, itself being so threatening to us, something that we couldn't see, couldn't grasp, was only there. And I was I'm very close to the ideas of Timothy Morton and the notion of hyper object, which is something that is greater than ourselves, something we cannot grasp that is everywhere, like only present. So all these um, things went tying up themselves through the progress of, of the residency. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it was interesting too in this time because nature as a hyper object and climate change, all of these things in the pandemic became so in the forefront of our consciousness. Yes. Just, you know, as a whole, and the, Grandiosity of these ideas and these things really, really come through, even in the final installation of the exhibition. It has this like this very, very awesome, not like awesome, <laughs> <laughs> awe-inspiring effect. With these scrolls that enter into your visual space with the atlas, so it's really, really been fantastic to watch this progress. Um, can you speak a little bit about your artistic process as a whole, and specifically how you approach different subjects and topics? And within the overall arc of your career, and then how this fits within that trajectory, because you've been exhibiting several very important projects throughout your career, and now this is a new one, but how it kind of fits into to the rest of the arc. Yeah, well, I think that um, even though it, the artistic freedom that we speak about <laughs> always is something that does not necessarily mean that we're like, uh, swing one project to another, but they do kind of respond to a process. So I started uh, doing photography around 30 years ago, and I was analog, 
it was analogical and it was chemistry based and it was material based. And I've always been interested in what photography does. That, I would say, is like the undercurrent of my work. To think about how we use photography as a language, how is it a tool, how it has overcome our lives and now to a point that is a parallel uh, kind of stream of life that circulates in the internet. So it, it's these wide concepts of how photography has um, like developed and, and um, like uh, changed and shifted throughout our usage of it. I, I'm very much interested in how that happens and what does photography do and what do images do, what do images want, and what happens when we connect images to each other. So this is very important for me in the sense that, and then also for me, one only image, even though I've done images that are just one, for me, it cannot grasp the experience. So uh, in like around 2010, I started building these kind of what I call my atlases, and it, I did start working with nature in 2013 after a visit to an ancient forest in Andorra and, and, and the Moorwoods in, in San Francisco area. So I started trying to um, reflect upon the experience of nature because to photograph nature is not to have the experience of nature. It's just uh, positioning myself into the situation of, of grasping something that is really impermanent. And that is the other notion that has always permeated in my work, which is the work of photography related to memory. And in that sense, I'm interested in how we build memories through the subjective uh, and how photography is a perfect tool for this construction. So the work that I've been developing throughout the years have been progressively uh, aiming to reflect upon how we collect all these images. And the, given that now we use digital and photography has become such a broad um, part of our lives where everything is documented, and, but it's documented in, into impermanence as well because images that are digital do not exist. They don't exist, they're just bits and pieces of code that are in a very abstract world part of ourself. And so in this sense, uh, thinking about photography uh, back to a materic place where so photography becomes an object again. And it's something that has very interested me very much. So these are kind of the conceptual threads where I build my work, but also I work a lot with the notion of the body and the notion of the woman's body and, and uh, domesticity and the whole. So it only makes sense to detach myself from the human part of it and just look at nature, which is kind of the largest home there is for us. <laughs> so I think that it has all been weaving itself through time. And uh, the collection of images are getting larger because the technical capacities also have changed. So it's something that is really, um, it's, it's weaving itself in a very interesting way. For example, this is only a very small part of everything that I have uh, documented through my past. And this is an archive that's always very subject subjective. It's, it's a personal thing. An atlas is something that always grows and always it, it needs um, a criteria, but it also depends on the person. Like, for example, when you look at the landscape, not everybody sees the same landscape. So in that sense, everything we do is very subjective. So I think that all these thematic um, threads have, you know, continued. You know, sometimes I devote myself more to the construction of the feminine and gender ideas in relation to nature, in relation to the body. But in this case, uh, I focus more on the construction of this kind of impermanence atlas. Yeah, and I, I encourage you to see some of these other projects on Amalia's website. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll give you some information, but um, that way you can see it within the context of her, her overall body of work as well. Um, so I want to go back a little bit about this idea with nature. And so, you know, I wanted to bring you into this conversation because in the work for, for every being as an island, you know, as Amalia mentioned, she had the research part of it, the academic part of it, and then the field work, the actually going out into our natural areas. We have 400, over 444 acres of, you know, unkempt, 
Um, so Sophia and, and Amaya really worked through this process for the, the past year, going out on several tracks. Um, I wonder if you can share a little bit about you know the practice during these hikes um, and how you guys came to kind of collaborate on where to go and, and what kind of places to revisit and all that. Well, um, it kind of started very organically that it was just a, a question of like, we should go for a hike. So then we went out, we went hiking, and we would stop like every couple of yards because she would point something out that I had walked over maybe like 20,000 times and she's like, this is an insane small patch of moss and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we started to kind of get into the practice of finding these spots that um, we would photograph and revisit upon each hike and kind of see how it would present itself differently at different times of day. Sometimes we would go like much closer to 5 o'clock or we would go closer to the middle of the day, but it was different every single time. But that there became small areas that we would visit um, almost like on the boat. So there, it came to be a process that was, it, it changed every time, but every time it felt more um, routine because I feel like I then became part of maybe observing how Amalia would decide on her, her tracks and photograph maybe like the main road islands or the rock and like back down at the bay. For instance, and it became collaborative where I would help like show her some different parts of um, the hikes that she maybe hadn't seen before, but she would have the intuition to choose where to photograph, and that helped me also maybe guide where we would go and like for the next spot on the hike if it was a more sunny area or a grassy area or the moss or any of the ferns and the shells. It, it was a, a discussion base, it was just a really nice natural process. <laughs> And nature has something that is as beautiful and as eerie or uncanny as, as it is. So every walk, you're always confronted not only to finding, it's, it's like a meditative process, like on and on we go and we have the same fears, but we kind of go over them. Like Sophia, I fear spiders, I fear snakes. And we're always talking about these things and then we have these long conversations about art history and we had conversations about like nature itself and the exuberance and this idea of the, the privilege to just have a place that is minimally like undisturbed. In, yeah, undisturbed. So that, that was very it was a good part of our thoughts was also Sophia does film photography, which is very interesting because you have you have to count your images. So if you have two rolls, you only have 70, 70 something pictures. So I would go on and on and on, uh, taking advantage of the digital. <laughs> and then Sophia would go like, and, you know, she looks and, and, and has a different approach. So I think it was a very, very organic, as she said, process. And it was very enriching for both of us. And uh, for me, it was really um, amazing to have somebody that already knew the premises and had you know, uh, this bravery within, and because for me, nature is I'm always, it's, it's always something that kind of overcomes our, you know, it's something powerful or, and larger than us. So we're always kind of immersed, like, um, having this feeling of, of, you know, kind of, it's a little fear of, of going on always. Like, you never know what's going to come. Like, if you live in the north, the bear might come out and eat you, <laughs> you know, all these human fears towards uh, something larger and, and the possibility of not controlling it. Because what we, we humans do basically is try to control everything. So whatever is not under your control as a human, you, you find that you're, it's a menace in a way. Yeah. <laughs> and I love, I mean, because I know the area, I love looking at your, at the at the being in the Island Scrolls at the Atlas because in the same way you were interested in following the steps of, let's say, John Lovell Small and how he documented the land, I can kind of create a pathway through where you, the both of you, walk through these images because I recognize certain landscapes or certain features. And so even though you had them as intent and research another natural 
my just the rigorosity because I really feel that my work is not rigorous in this in the scientific way. I mean, I feel I'm a very rigorous artist in my own practice, but um, I do not take notes at the time. I do not measure. I do not do all this kind of scientific method for my for my practice. It's very intuitive as well. So, but yes, I agree that that you can find that some, I come from a family of scientists, so I think that that also has to do, I've always been, like my first ever work that I showed in my life was photographs of tree barks. And I see myself coming back to nature in this way, like very differently before I used to do black and white, now I do color and digital and all, like 30 years have passed, but um, yeah, it's very, it's very much this pretension, you know, we artists try to always kind of uh, get closer to some other um, disciplines, but yeah, yeah, but humbly, I'm not a scientist. And some of the naturalists weren't here. Yeah, they were I hope, yeah, I can imagine. Excellent. Um, so, if you could share a little bit, I know a big influence for the, the structure of the atlas comes from can you talk a little bit about that reference? Sure. Um, well, Abby Warburg was a huge influence on me. I discovered it later, after I had studied art history in the university. And for me, it was amazing to find that he was trying to tell the story of art history without words. And that was a revelation. And it was through photography and through the combination of different images that would make different sense. Another thing that is very important for me uh, through Abby Warburg is the concept of the pathos formal. And the uh, part of my German, I don't speak German, but it's pathos formal means uh, that um, what is the psychological and emotional impact that images carry within. And this, having images placed one by side by side, creates a different reading. And because of the landscape, it's never the same for everybody. Um, to prove is that Sophie and I have been going out for, for hikes together and we shoot sometimes the same things, but never our work looks alike. So I, I, I think a lot about this idea of having our work of building an emotional map of images and having this emotional connection and this kind of, um, the, the idea of bringing back to a material, physical uh, object in the shape of a scroll is just a system of classification of organ. I, I am all for accumulation of images and objects. I have worked also with a lot of objects in this process. You don't see them here, but in every walk, I was collecting debris or things that nature would just, you know, discard, like seeds or um, bones and um, um, pellets, uh, owl pellets and crazy things and I'm collecting all these things because everything is so impermanent and the only um, the only thing that we have left is whatever we object we connect and this is kind of a bridge to all the memory of the place as and it, they work the same as like a hyperlink to the to the place itself. So I intend these um, atlases to work as Abby Barr works in the sense that it is a system of classification, it's a system of organization, it's a discursive uh, system, it's an archive, it's a way of telling a story and having images speak in between themselves. So that's how he's been a very powerful uh, ground for my work in the past 10 years. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you want to share a little bit about so the first scroll here, and it was also the image that we used on the website, and it's the first, it was the first image you actually shared with the public of the island. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so the island as a concept for me has been very, very seductive. Like it's something that seduces me because an island is always a possibility. But the island has uh, this thing that it interrupts the landscape. It is apparently independent, but it's interconnected. It is a space for receiving things because of the tides, like conceptually that the island receives. And then uh, it, it's just a matter of 
but it's a presence that if we use it symbolically or metaphorically to uh, speak about how we connect to the world, it, every, and that's the name of the show, like every being is an island, it's this idea of the possibility of being your own autonomous being, but also being a part of a larger scheme of things. And um, I think uh, it was Derrida who said that um, when you dream of an island, it means that you have already separated from land and you are starting a new life all, of, all by yourself. And then I'm, I'm very fond of the thoughts of, of Edouard Glissant uh, in, in, in relation to the Caribbean and in relation to the creolization and the, the idea of the archipelago in which every, every culture and every system is interconnected but has to keep itself so it, it has its own identity. So the island for me is this space for uh, thinking about how um, we can, every little thing we find, we encounter, is always a, a thing that, that has its own life, but it's still part. So it's kind of this umbrella idea, uh, the idea of the island. And then this, uh, this interruption of the landscape that continuously was changing and shifting, and it's the home of the birds in the winter, and the tides leave them almost bare naked, the roots out because it's all full of mangroves. So it was a very beautiful and poetic place to start the work with. And, and this openness to the idea of, of this thing in the middle of the ocean. And it also represents the idea of boundaries. It's, it's that separation between the land and, and the waters and then land again, and all these kind of, of constructions of of spatial uh, delimitations that I'm, I'm interested in. Yeah, and, that, and that specific, I mean, those islands are so iconic. But yeah, that's even that's like as you say, they're so full of mystery. There's so much, there's so much embedded into them that that was such a beautiful poetic point to start with, and then to see it amass into all the other scrolls is quite, it's quite amazing. Um, so. We talked a little bit about the naturalists, and you kind of talked a little bit about how you approach your project. I'll we'll skip over that one. Um, for people who might not be aware, the exhibition is actually comprised of three bodies of work. So you have the everyday, the island scrolls, you have bodies of water, one the video, and then the photographs that are in the entrance hall. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at them, they're out outside of the, the main space. So after the yeah, you, you, if you yeah. climb the, the the stairs to your right. Yeah, you can see there's only three or four. four of many. Yeah. And several of those. Um, can you talk a little bit about specifically the nature more of those photographs out there with respect to your process and how they connect to the scrolls and to the rest? Yeah, um, one of the things that I think about a lot, and I have the time to think about while being here, is the way we humans connect to the concept of nature. And we have always thought, as humans, that nature kind of belongs to us, that we're able to modify it as we want, to use it, abuse it, take whatever we need from it, and there's a not, it's a hierarchical relationship to nature. We're not, we're not looking at nature as, um, we're not looking at nature in a democratic way. We're looking in a, but as humans, as, as a whole, well, this is debatable in the sense that, of course, we speak about who has had the power to control nature has been, of course, the, the systems of power that were probably patriot, white, male, predominantly male uh, structures. So in, in that sense, um, our connection to nature has been of, depending on the cultural, of course, landscape of every single place has been one of, of kind of empowering in our Occidental world, and speaking mostly of our, you know, Western world. And um, the idea that we kind of feel this uh, right to do whatever we feel in, in terms of devastating the, 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 uh, the landscape and nature is what has brought us here. So this is why we call ourselves being into the Anthropocene, and because it's where we have done the most amount of modifications that are 
causing the cl climate change are humanly motivated. So everything, the hurricane that's getting up there north today didn't happen before. The fires in California didn't happen. This is all, and, and we could go on and on and on speaking about how. But going to the, to the pieces, so this is my little, uh, I call them natur morts, and they are a little, um, a little bit of this kind of uh, game between what we find and how photography operates in terms of being a, a tool of, veracity, uh, of the truth and being a tool of, fi of fiction. And for example, these are, are made in a way that they are photographs of direct photographs of landscape that I printed and then I uh, incorporated elements that I had found in the landscape, like the real objects, and rephotographed them. So I've worked on, on and off in my life, I've worked a lot with the idea of double exposures, superimposing images to create these layers of, of kind of boundary shifting that you kind of doubt, what am I looking at? Is this a projection? Is this a double, like a double image? Is this a double exposure? But I'm interested in this idea of, of construction, of constructing your own nature, kind of this idea of the human uh, creating its own landscape. And I also think a lot about it myself being, and this is something that I felt when I was uh, with Sophia in the woods, like we would find bones and we would look at them week after week after week and then when they were dry and uh, they didn't have any more remains inside, we, we would take a little bone, we would take a little leaf, we would take things that, that called up our, our attention and, and we were playing the naturalist there and, and we were woman naturalists and I think that's very powerful as an idea because there has not been woman naturalists in our history. And to be, to have the opportunity to feel like one and, and, and act like one and, and create images as, I, as if I were, were a naturalist was very empowering for me as a woman. And I feel this connection to uh, this space in, 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 in nature because it, it brings me back the exuberance of my tropic, my Caribbean tropic. And the fact that I can make images that are created by the things like the duplication, triplication of objects in layers, I think it's very enriching. And it's a different process than the scrolls. So it gives me more liberty or freedom to operate. And they're fun to do in a way. And I love to have these, because I love nature more as a subject in our history. And all, a big part of my work also has dealt with how we look at art history and how we look as women, how women look at art history and how we don't find ourselves there. So, because it's who told the history problem. So all these things add up into my process. I mean, it, it sounds more than what it is because it's really a kind of a collage of works, but I feel that there's many layers of thought behind the fact that I'm creating a new landscape that is a fictitious one and I'm kind of giving it the name of a natural more. So. No, I mean, and I, and I love that you're sharing that with us. Um, every time we speak, there's another layer of the work that becomes evident and clear, and there's so much thought process behind that, so I'm really, really happy to be sharing that with the audience. Um, and we hadn't discussed that, actually. I love that idea, because we've talked about that, and we've talked about this problem with our history, but yeah, in the naturalist world, how, you know, even though you're not naturalist, you've asserted yourself as female naturalists and created a body of work that, yes. that echoes that experience. And it echoes it from the experience of being a woman. For me, it's very relevant. It's totally different. And, that's, and as much as I love, you know, Humboldt and Gering and all the traveling artists that came from the Americas and did wonderful works, the, the debris and the, like all these um, Bellerman and, and Morisot and Pizarro, all these painters that came to the, it was always a masculine eye looking at the exotic. Right. We have always been the object of the exotic, we women. And now we, I get to, you know, do my own experimentation and I have the freedom to work in my, in my field as, you know, with this autonomy, right, which is very important for me. Uh, I know this is an ongoing yes. uh, project for you. Can you share a little bit about Sure. This 
Um, the thing that we're uh, seeing here, it doesn't have the volume today because of, otherwise we wouldn't be able to be having a conversation, but it is, um, uh, this is kind of a parenthesis in a larger uh, piece that I've, I've, I've been developing with a collection of video images of all the bodies of water that I confront. And this just has response to this idea, loosely on this idea of the water as a hyper object and, and this connection between the boundary of the land and the water and how we are constantly facing these, well, and I have to say again that the landscape is only subjective because everybody sees the landscape in a different way. Somebody that lives in a mountain may not get to the waters or just in the form of a river or a little creek or, but um, the idea for me is to, again, think a lot about um, impermanence. Every single minute of water we see will not be the same, so I just try to kind of think of this atlas of impermanence into a large, long, descriptive uh, piece that in the future will let us know everything that has been in the past. It's looking towards the future in the sense that I will continue to be adding up pieces of, of fragments of water and water being the most important element in the earth. I think it's something that I, I constantly think of and, and how it affects everything, the tides and the, the submarine life and how we have affected water as well. So it's just a it's like a poetic reflection on the importance and the relevance of the impermanence in, in the shape of water. And that is something that I, I will introduce. This is going to continue to grow because every time I come here, I continue to do my uh, additions. And, um, and basically, I also think a lot about things that are not going to be here in the near future. Uh, so this is something I do keep in mind because it, it's, it's about what we think of when we think of nature. It's like we think we dominate it, but it's really the other way around. So the, the ones that might not be around are going to be the humans, but maybe all these documentation and, <laughs> and the remains of archives that we have built will give an idea of what we had and what we had experienced in the form of nature. Do you see yourself, Amalia? Uh, so, so all this was clearly done here during residency, but um, are there other sites, other spaces that you that you look forward to investigating or continuing this type of artistic process and research? Well, I would love to continue working here in, in the subtropics. I, I fell in love with, like, this is something that I, it gets in your vein. It's like a drug. You need to go out. <laughs> like, you need to go out and be there. It's what makes me the happiest person. Like, I, you know, I, I think a lot about many things in terms of the art system and how we connect, you know, ideas and how we are part of the relevance of being here, like, in this world, in this moment, for me, uh, uh, acquired a bigger idea after I, I had the opportunity to really be there, looking, what, what is it that these eyes are looking, and how can I transmit this to other people by my experience? And this, for me, is very, um, is very enriching. I would love to work, like I, I'm, I'm looking forward in the future to see if I can do an air residency or further continue doing uh, um, images at the Everglades. I mean, as, as long as I'm here in Florida, I think that there's going to be a very important focus um, on nature. And I'm very interested in bringing nature to the museum for some strange reason. I like this idea of imposing a cultural, in a cultural space, a kind of this larger idea, which is everything that's around us. I, I had this idea of like, for example, when I did the Moore Woods project uh, in 2013, 2017, because I went twice, I made a big room full of this bark. Of course, you, when you are there, you don't smell the bark, you don't smell the humidity, you don't smell the forest. But it's this kind of uh, honest or like this expression of that you feel when you are in nature, like when you are in front of the landscape, that makes you feel so so, I don't know, enriched and empowered. And um, so I think I'm going to continue. I have other ideas of other atlases that I want to continue building uh, because some of them are ongoing processes as well. So 
I think that, uh, yes, I will probably continue doing hikes with Sophia. <laughs> and, <laughs> It's a, it's a protect, very protect, like everything is protected, but this is more protected. So I'm planning to do a hike on that area and I'm waiting for the approval. So this is the only thing, it's not that I, I, I didn't do it because I, I couldn't or I regret not doing it. It's just that it's a, a matter of, of getting the roots to, to, to be able to access, uh, like to access that space. But uh, no, it was on the contrary. I, I feel so privileged to have been able to reflect on what our relationship to nature is and think of all these structures that nature brings like we think it's we're not part of it it's because it's defining what we are not like nature defines what we are not like it's just the boundary between us and the space we live in so all these reflections were very very enriching and the possibility of looking really to things in a very daily kind of way, like every single day looking at the same things and seeing how everything shifts and everything is about flux and mutability was very, very enriching. So I am, if anything, I'm almost grateful to the virus. It sounds terrible because many, you know, it, it was not the same for many other cities or many, I mean, I'm very empathetic with everything that, you know, humanity has had to deal with in, and such polemics towards the pandemic and you know, many issues that have come along with humanity as a concept, as a construct. But no, this was a total privilege. Like, I can't ask for more. I would stay here if I could. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I would see you with Instagram and the rules to be on I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Sometimes you would put in Instagram photos of yourself or Facebook in the studio with all your specimens. I found it fascinating. That's one of the reasons why I came. And how did you choose? Because that room was filled 
it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, how do you choose which ones um, were important enough for you to, to That's a great them? question. It's very intuitive. Um, I, I, I believe in, in Baudelaire's idea of, of the correspondence. You know, you look at things, things look back at you. And that is something that I just felt. Like sometimes I walk by some, like a, let's say, a leaf. And I walk by the leaf and I say, no, I'm going to pick up and not yet another leaf. And then I go back and I'm like, no, I have to have it. It's something that it, it becomes this kind of, I'm a collector. I love collecting things and I have collections of objects. But now I have a collection of things that, are, that come from nature. And for me, this is like they're precious treasures. Like I, I am um, in the process of moving out of my studio here. So I'm wrapping everything up and putting everything in boxes. and. Unfortunately, I was not able because of this house being a historic preserved uh, monument or a museum, you cannot bring uh, inside uh, organic matter. Uh, the idea, of, and this is when the images that are on the hallway come, uh, they're, they're fun because they show some of those objects that I collected. So I wanted, I wanted to see, like my, my studio became like a little dark, like a lab. I was looking at how things would dry. Like sometimes you you take some like um, sargasso sea, um, sargasso algae, and you bring it to the studio, and it's crispy, yellow, beautiful. And then the next day, it's totally wrinkled and brown. I would photograph all these aging processes of the, all these debris, like the, the leaves of of um, what's the name of lechos. Uh, Oh my gosh, I forgot the name. Ferns? Ferns. Ferns. The leaf, the ferns, if you don't photograph them the same day, they curl. And so uh, looking at all these objects, I was in awe. So it, it's, it was very intuitive on, one, on the one end. And then I'm attracted to certain things like, um, like everybody, you know, some, I, did, I did not choose to uh, collect human uh, debris because that would have been another project or would have been another idea. Um, sometimes I would collect curiosities left by humans, but 99% was a thing that I found in nature. And I'm planning to continue to work on them. I have I've been photographing all these single objects and probably in the future, I will be showing them in a display and um, you know, trying to think of these uh, discarded objects. I think it's very, because it's, it's just what life is. It's, you know? I have one more question. How did you decide that you would all this collection of images, how did you decide to display them in this manner? How did it, in this classification? Yes. Well, for me, an archive is, is something that is very, um, it's something that's really alive. Even though you see them now as a fixed ID, like a fixed image in uh, Canvas, um, they are really digital images. So I basically can work around the grid and, 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 and use the image, I mean, move them around, include more, remove, like so. It, but it, it's a long and probably the least uh, loved part for me is to build these the scrolls. In this case, I use scrolls as a format, but sometimes I do um, just the single images, just a large volume of images or some other kinds of scrolls. Like, I, I've used that classification strategy and, and I've had, you know, for many years, the, this idea of the accumulation of objects and things to uh, kind of express the way we live right now and how we live in a culture of abundance and, and and over and just think about the abundance of nature. There's no way I could even get close to having samples of everything that nature holds. But it was more or less what drew my attention, called me, and it's a connection that you feel. So, well, it's just a little, a little bit of it, but it shows the abundance of what you collect. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's like, um, my family's like, why do you have to bring so much stuff? 
but it's the way I am. I, <laughs> I don't know how to be so different. But yeah, it's, it's an intuitive process and it's very, it's part of me. I've always collected shells and leaves and things and what can I do? <laughs> Yeah. I also wanted to share with you, um, speaking of the studio practice, we have a catalog, well it's like a, a brochure with an essay that Sophia and I wrote with images, and in it there are images of the, of the of Amalia studio and her studio practice. They're in the back, and I think someone went to put out the line, so our designers are here who helped design the piece, Juanita and Raul. Uh, I encourage you to grab one. They're beautiful. They're, they're broadsheets, so you can open them up, and one side is the text with several images, and then the, the main side is an edited version of the first scroll of Every Being is an Island, Island One, and so you can take that home and, and put that up, and it's a really nice commemorative mm -hmm. example of Amalia's work. So with that, thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, we are setting up some complimentary wine and sparkling water out on the front porch of the Stone House. Um, you're also welcome, I'll put the volume up on the video as well, so you're welcome to enjoy the exhibition. And Amalia will be generous with her time a little bit today if you have any other questions that you want to talk with, with her directly. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. during my process here has been amazing and I'm really thankful to have worked and have had the opportunity to work with such an amazing team of um, curious, respected, like people that are engaged with this property and this land and, and I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much.